Well, hey there, this is Kim Constable. Welcome to the Strong and Sculpted Podcast, the podcast by me, Kim Constable, also known as The Sculpted Vegan, soon also to be known as The Million Dollar Mentor. Uh Uh-huh, how do you like that? First, she was known as The Sculpted Vegan. Then she became The Million Dollar Mentor. For many of you um, who follow me, you will know that we are launching a brand new business on the 21st of September called The Million Dollar Mentor. Um, this is going to be an absolutely and utterly epic business. I really have been like, oh, you have no idea how excited my whole team has been about this idea. It's absolutely epic. And so before we dive into this week's podcast episode, um, which is all about blame and responsibility, um, it's actually especially about vegans and why they're so angry. <laughs> Not all vegans, but many vegans and why they're so angry. I've been hit by an onslaught of hate and anger this week. So I really just wanted to dissect a little bit of that and bring break it down a little bit more for you. For those of you who are the more passionate, ethical vegans out there, uh, there's no blame or punishment in this podcast. As you know, I do not do that, but hopefully everyone will get something out of it. So before we dive into that, I do just want to tell you really quickly, if I may, and you can skip on through this if you're like, no, boring. But I do want to tell you about the Million Dollar Mentor, which is launching on the 21st of September. Uh, Basically, I've had an idea to build a business program for a long, long time. I want to teach people what it is that I do, my system. But I didn't exactly know what I was going to teach. I just know that every single day on Instagram, and on email and on social media, I get questions about business. How do you grow your business? How do you do this? What do you do with Facebook ads? What do you, whatever. And, you know, many people know that I have built this business from scratch in under three years. This year, we're probably going to have a $4 million turnover. That's what we're on track for. So in under three years, we built a business with a $4 million turnover. And I've done it very systematically in exactly the same way that I built my body and I you know, uh, got to the stage and, and sculpted and, and and then the way I homeschool my kids and the way I run my house and like everything I do is a system. And so I built the business the same way. And I realized that the system that I use to build the business is not only sustainable, it's reproducible. So I can teach this system to other people. And not only can I teach it to other people, but I can use it, well, I was about to use it again to build my next million dollar business. So I had this really epic idea recently. And I called Mark, my creative director, who's like my sounding board for everything. I called him. I was like, Mark, 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 I need to talk to you. I've had a really good idea. And he was like, what, what, what is it? I was like, I had this really good idea for like, for for how we can launch the business. And he was like, go on, tell me. So I said, why don't we start a Facebook group? And Mark was like, a Facebook group, Kim, really? And I was like, no, 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 we do hear, hear me out, hear me out. I was like, we're going to build this new business, right? We're going to launch next March. We're going to build, you know, a we're going to build this blueprint for teaching people how to build a business, not a little side hustle, not like a, oh, you know, create your $97 PDF and you can make some money. No, 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 no. This is for people who want to build a sustainable seven figure business that is literally life changing. I'm going to break down my entire system that I have used and teach it to other people. So I said to Mark, I was like, why don't we show people us building the business in a private Facebook group? And he was like, oh, it's fucking genius. I love it. And I was like, so here's here's how it'll happen, right? So here's what's going to happen. On the 21st of September, we're going to open a new Facebook group. It's going to close again at the start of October. And then for the next six months, anyone who joins that Facebook group is going to get unfettered access to me and my team behind the scenes for a full six months while we build our new million dollar business. And this group is going to be called the, well, the new business is going to be called the million dollar mentor, right? So the new business will be like the million dollar program, right? That's what we're going to do, the million dollar business. I don't think we haven't thought of, we haven't really nailed down the name completely, but um, the company name is the million dollar mentor. And so basically you're, if you know, anyone who joins is going to be able to see behind the scenes of how we run the Sculpted Vegan. We're going to show absolutely everything from how I create programs in my head to how I pull together the concepts to how they're then and designed and the videos are created and how the Facebook ads are created and how the emails are created and how the entire system works. So it's literally a behind the scenes system where we have spent thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on equipment. We're setting up my entire office as a recording studio. We're going to be doing lives in the group. We're going to be recording with a videographer. 
um, and having them edited and uploaded all the time. This is literally going to be like a reality TV show, except where you get to ask the stars questions. You don't just get to watch, you get to say, why are you doing that? And what about that? And what about this? And and how can I apply this to my business? And, and so I'll be in the group every single day answering questions. And so will my team, we'll be doing Q&As and lives. And oh my God, it's like, it's just like, oh my, it's just like, it just makes me so excited because it's what I love to do best. I love to help people. I love to answer questions. And I love to be completely transparent in everything that I do. People always say to me, Kim, you know, you, um, you, you always show the numbers of your business. Like I'm always going, look how much I made this month. And look, this was me three years ago. And this was me here. And look, this is me now. And people are like, you're not afraid to show your numbers. You're so transparent. And I'm like, that I'm not afraid to show them because I'm actually getting them. Many people like to pretend they're doing better than they are. They're like, oh, I run a, a I've started two seven figure businesses. And you're like, really? Two seven figure businesses? Was that your projections? Were those your actual numbers? You know, because a lot of times the numbers that people say they're getting aren't actually the numbers that they're getting. But with me, what you see is what you get. There's no back doors with me. I will never pretend. I will never lie to you. I will always show you exactly what goes on. So that's what we're launching on September 21st. And so I was like, I'm going to have to rebrand myself. It's going to have to be known as the Sculpted Vegan, also known as the Million Dollar Mentor or the Million Dollar Mentor, formerly known as The Sculpted Vegan. I think like, oh, I'm going to have like this whole double personality, this whole double pseudonym thing going on. We're just going to be like, today, Kim, are you The Sculpted Vegan or are you The Million Dollar Mentor? So um, it's like the two sides of my crack, the two sides of my personality. There's like strong buff in the gym, Kim. And then there's over here, there's like sleek, you know, suited and booted and eyelashed and lovely long flowing hair, you know, business Kim, ball breaker Kim, you know? So um Anyway, if you guys are interested in that, we actually do have a website um, set up. We have a waiting list set up on the website where you can be notified the instant it launches. The, the website is themilliondollarmentor.com, themilliondollarmentor.com. You can go there, you can sign up, and you will be notified the instant that it launches, but you can mark your calendar if you're like, oh my God, I am so in for this, Kim. This is like my dream come true <laughs> to work personally with you. You could even build your own business while you were while we were building ours. You could be like, okay, everything she does, I'm I'm going to do over here. Like, I'm literally going to copycat everything she does. And uh, that's what I want you to do because I want everyone to be successful. So, the million dollar mentor.com, hop on over there. Um, what did I hear the other day? Someone's like, oh, just slide into our DMs. And I was like, slide into your DMs. Why not just say, send me a message? Like, why do you have to slide into your DMs? I think it was like even, it was quite a stuffy website as well. They were like, if this, if you're interested in this, just slide into our DMs. I was like, no, 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 I'm not going to slide into your DMs. I'm just going to write you a message. So just go to the website. Don't slide into it. Just go there. Just put in your name and your email and you will be first notified whenever the program launches. Okay, so now that I have completely and utterly sold you, hopefully, on The Million Dollar Mentor, uh, what else do I have to tell you? I have to tell you that the winner of August's podcast uh, review competition was the lovely Georgia Perry. Georgia, congratulations. Georgia is like one of our most committed listeners. She leaves, uh, let me think, I think she leaves one review on every single episode of the podcast each month. So she leaves four reviews per month. And finally, this month, it was her turn. <laughs> she is, uh, Christina contacted her today to let her know that she has won any Sculpted Vegan program of her choice. I'm not sure what she's chosen, but congratulations, Georgia. You got a shout out in the podcast too. And I know that you listen. So it's lovely to have you as a loyal listener. Hope you enjoy your program. Um, and if you too want to be in with the chance of winning one of our Sculpted Vegan programs in September, then you all you have to do is leave a review wherever you listen to this podcast. Send me a screenshot of the review as a direct message on Instagram. If you don't do that step, you will not win. And then we will choose the winner for September and we will announce it at the start of October. Okay, so let's get into this week's content. What has spawned this week's uh, content on the podcast? Well, it's quite a few things that have happened. And I guess it all stemmed back to uh, when a very good friend of mine here in Belfast, um, I don't think she'll mind if I mention her name. Her name is Tiffany Bryan. Absolutely love Tiffany. Very successful blogger, online influencer. And she was literally being hounded, trolled, and trashed, um, both on the website Tattle, which you guys know I find highly entertaining, the shit they talk about me on there, and also on Instagram. And 
she decided actually to close her Instagram account because she was being trolled and trashed so much. And it was really, she 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 went inactive. She started up a new personal account and she said her life is so much happier and so much more joyful since she is not an Instagram influencer anymore. So since that happened, I was really incensed by that and really, um, just really annoyed on Tiffany's behalf. And I decided to stop ignoring the haters and the trolls who who troll me, but instead to bring them more to light and to answer them and to, you know, um, and to, I was going to say publicly shame them. It's not, it's, it's not that I want to publicly shame. It's not like naming and shaming. It's more that bad things don't exist in the world because of the people who do them, but because of the people who stand by and say nothing. That's why bad things exist, because we turn a blind eye and we say nothing. But I refuse to say nothing if someone is going to act in a way that is mean and disrespectful and trolling and they're going to be keyboard warriors Well, you're and you're going to do it to me. Well, I'm damn well going to expose you. I'm not going to let you get away with it. So I kind of have a little bit of a, a bee in my bonnet at the minute, I guess, about, you know, trolls and their disgusting behavior online. And so I have a... Um, uh, I guess, a filter for it at the minute as well. And so recently what happened was a woman, uh, I posted something on my Instagram about Botox, something about getting Botox. And anyone who follows me here regularly will know that I am plant-based. I am not ethically vegan in terms of I do use Botox. I do use medications. But by the way, many, many vegans go, oh, well, it's okay to use medications, but you can't use Botox. I'm like, well, why? Because they're both like pharmaceutical tested on animals. No, 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 no. But it's, it's not okay to use Botox. It's only okay to use medication. I'm like, okay, this is where just the line gets a little blurry for me and your definitions, you angry, preachy vegans. Um, so anyway, I, I mentioned something about using Botox. And I think some woman had asked me a question about, oh, this is disgusting. Why are you using Botox? You know, are you not, are you not vegan? And I replied very respectfully and said, I am, I am plant-based. I'm very open about it. I never hide it. I've done many videos and podcasts and, and talks about it and whatever. And um, and she said, she came back and was like, oh, well, I, I assumed that you were vegan when I followed you and I'm highly disappointed by this. And you blah, blah, blah. And she went into a whole rant or a whole kind of, you know, uh, judgmental kind of, you know, um, punishment uh, paragraph, I guess, of me. <laughs> and um, she was like, you should change your name to the sculpted plant-based. And I was like, and I just messaged back and said, yeah, you know what, you're probably right. And genuinely, I wasn't open. I wasn't even looking to fight with her. I didn't care. She has her opinion. That's fine. You know what? There's a lot of people believe that I should change my name, but I'm going to talk about that in a minute and why I don't. But I was like, yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Well, fuck me. She did not like that. See, whenever I told her she was right, she went off on a rampage, like a rampage rant about me. It was like, I was, you know, on Instagram, it was like the full character count rampage. And then she flounced away and she blocked me on Instagram so I couldn't respond and none of my followers could respond and then she went over into one of the uh, Facebook groups it's the uh, vegan women's bodybuilding group I think it's called vegan vegan women's bodybuilding group um, online and they fucking hate me over there <laughs> it's a rule you're not allowed to discuss my programs over there by the way which literally just screams <laughs> jealousy, uh, you know, but um, because I'm doing so well. But anyway, so she went over there on a rampage and they all had this massive shit fest, this massive hate fest about me over there. And all my followers were messaging me going, oh my God, you should see what's happening about you in the vegan women, women's bodybuilding group. And I was like, really? Or she was like, shit, oh my God, these women hate you. I've never seen so much hatred. And I was like, well, you know, what they write about me is really just an expression of how they feel inside. It's totally okay. It doesn't bother me at all. But since then, I have now started started to get these women coming over to my page who are, you know, who obviously had assumptions, made assumptions about me and are now highly disappointed in me and feel the need to come over to my page and tell me just how disappointed they are in me. And I, I'm just like, oh dear, oh love, you know, you just make yourself look like a bit of dick whenever you do that. But I just thought, you know what, this is worth a podcast episode because here is the comment that I got this morning, right? So a comment from, um, Dominique, her name was, uh, and she she left this comment on my Instagram page. And she said, so this is exactly what the comment says. I'm going to read it to you, okay? So she said, sculpted plant-based chick. I get that it doesn't have the same ring to it, but it's a shame that you continue to market yourself as a vegan when you still happily consume animal death in other areas of your life. I'm super pissed to have spent a ton of money on your products, believing that you were vegan for all the right reasons. Now I find that you are vegan 
only where and when it's convenient or when it's making you a shitload of money. It's the suffering animals that lose in the end. Yeah, I'm angry. Yeah, I've left all of your groups because of it. And yes, I felt it was important to let you know how disappointed I am, even if you don't care. And I was like, oh, wow. So um, so I responded to her and I thought, this is an ongoing issue. This really needs to be addressed in the podcast. And just a little, a little side note, a little caveat. I went on to Sam Cart, which is our payment processor, and looked for Dominique um, on there. And I, I didn't know what her surname was. And I've since asked her for her surname. I was like, you know what? If you like, send me your email address and I will refund your money happily. No problem at all. So anyway, I looked for her online and there were about four or five Dominiques who have purchased programs from us and not one of them has spent more in total than $194. Now, that may be an absolute shitload of money to her, but believe me, there are people in my programs who have bought every single program we've ever released and have spelt, spent thousands and thousands of dollars. So I wouldn't exactly call $194 a shitload of money, but anyway, that's as a little side note, just thought I'd throw that in there. So here's what I want to ask, Okay. After I read that, here's what I would love you to ask yourselves or I'd love for you to consider. Why does someone get angry and blame? So that whole paragraph that she wrote was just full of anger and blame. Anger, blame, and punishment. That's that's all that was in there. But why does someone get angry and blame? Well, the reason someone would write something like that or the reason why someone would get angry in that way towards me, someone they've never met before, is is for one simple reason. People see me on the internet and they, they see the word vegan, they see someone sculpted, they see someone strong and female and successful in the world, and they go, oh, this person is like me. They are the same as me. We are sisters from a different mother. Like they they project all of their feelings about animals and the world and and about, you know, and about bodybuilding and about or, or anything, whatever it is that's important to them. They see me, they see the word vegan, they have a, a feeling around the word vegan. It evokes a certain feeling or an understanding inside of them, and they project that understanding onto me. So they interact with me energetically or even just on, you know, on, on social media, which isn't even physically in person, they interact with me in their minds as if I am one of them or like them or their best friend. So they see me in the programs and they see me on social media or they follow my stories and they feel every day as they follow me, that we are friends. I get people coming up to me all the time out in Belfast, right? And they'll come over to me and they'll say, I'm really sorry to interrupt you, but are you the sculpted vegan? And I'll say, and I'll say, yes. And they'll be like, oh my God. And, or they'll go come over to me and they'll go, they'll go, hi. And I go, oh, hi, hello. And I think, fuck, who is this person? I don't recognize them at all. But the way they've said hello to me, I, I, I honestly feel like I maybe we've like been on holiday together. Maybe we went to school together. Maybe like we birthed children together. You know, the, the the warmth of their greeting really makes me think that we know each other really well. And then they go, oh my God, oh my God, you don't even know me. That's so ridiculous. But I feel that I know you because I watch your stories and I follow you on Instagram. And I'm like, oh, that is so sweet. Thank you. We end up having a conversation. But my point is they feel like they know me so well. And I have no fucking clue who they are. So, it's like, but it's always lovely to meet new people, you know. And so this person who, these people who who follow me online or who see the word vegan, they see me and 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 they they make shit up about me, okay? But here's the problem, right? They're not really seeing me. They're not seeing me, Kim Constable. Kim Constable married to Ryan, mother of, you know, Corey, Kai, Maya, Jack, you know, daughter of Pam and Matt and stepdaughter of, you know, of of Ian and Naomi and Sarah and I have loads of step parents and Rob, you don't even want to talk about all that. But they don't see me as sister of Carol and Carrie. They don't see me as sweet little Kimmy, whose you know nickname was Kimmy whenever she was growing up. He loved to entertain people. They don't see me, you know, the struggles and, you know, walking buddy every day. They don't see me in my life. They don't see me. They see a projection of themselves when they look at me. And that's not me. That's their own projection. So Whenever they see me not acting in a way that upholds their value, 
They get angry with me and they blame me and they punish me because it hurts a part of them that they have put in the box. Okay. We call it in, in therapy, putting it in the box. So they have a part of themselves that, um, that isn't perfectly ethically vegan. But they don't want to recognize that part of themselves and they don't want to talk about that part of themselves and they don't want to even to acknowledge that they have that part because the, the, the part of themselves that they project onto the world is the pure, ethical, supporter of animals, nonviolent, compassionate, you know, all of these feelings and thoughts. That's what, that's what they, that's what they project onto the world. And the part of themselves that isn't like that, which everybody has, by the way, because we all have the yin and the yang, they put in a box and they don't want to look at. So whenever they see it exposed in me, they get really, really angry and they blame me. But it has nothing to do with me and it has everything to do with them. They're blaming me for not living up to their expectation of me. Is that actually anything to do with me? I'm just over here being me. I'm just over here, sculpted vegan, the million dollar mentor, just running my business and walking my dog and looking after my family. I'm just doo -doo 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 -doo, just like moving around the world, having a great time, buying loads of Louis Vuitton. I shouldn't talk about that. But, you know, I'm just over here being me, right? And they're fucking pissed with me because I have, have let them down. But that's really nothing to do with me, right? But they want to blame me for not living up their expectations. So whenever I was researching this podcast, I thought, Let's look at blame, right? Let's look at the dictionary definition of blame. I love definitions because I think definitions are really, really good for giving you a concept to work off. So blame as a verb, okay, in the dictionary is in the English Collins Dictionary, whatever it's called, or whatever it's called. I don't know. Google told me, okay, I didn't even look up the English Dictionary, just looked up Google. So here's what Google says blame means as a verb, okay? To feel or declare that someone or something is responsible for a fault or a wrong. Let me read that again. The blame as a verb is to feel or declare that someone or something is responsible for a fault or a wrong. So what Dominique was saying to me was, I feel wronged. I feel wronged because I believed in you. I had a belief that you were a certain way and you have not lived up to that belief and now you are wrong for not living up to my belief. Now, when I put it like that, can you see just how crazy that is? I have a belief and I'm angry at you for not living up to my belief. Is that really anything to do with the other person? Not in the slightest, but this is what happens, right? This is what happens and this is what vegans do. And this is, this is why so many of them cause so much destruction in the world. And it's, you know, and I know that they look at me and they think that I'm completely and utterly, you know, wrecking the mission. I'm not standing up and being a good vegan. I'm not being a living representation of what a vegan should be because that's the most important thing to them. The most important thing to the angry preachy vegans is to be a shining beacon of veganism. I will stand up on top of the vegan mountain and I will wear my medal with pride, my vegan medal. And the vegan police can come and investigate me and they will find no wrongdoing because I am the perfect example of veganism. That is how they promote veganism in the world. Do you know how I promote veganism in the world? In a completely different way. Let me tell you how. So whenever I first started The Sculpted Vegan, the business, I didn't know that there was a difference between plant-based, vegan, ethical vegan, vegan, which is now a word, by the way. Did you know that? A vegan who eats eggs is a vegan. I thought it was quite cool, actually. So, um, I, so I started, I just believed whenever I was younger that vegan meant, many of you who've listened to all my podcasts will know this story, so apologize if I'm telling it again to you. But whenever I went vegan, I, I believed vegan to, to mean that you don't eat animal products. So you don't eat butter, eggs, cheese, uh, milk powder, you know, gelatin obviously isn't vegan, isn't even vegetarian, but you don't eat animal products. That is what I believed vegan to mean. And that is what every single other person that I knew in my life, they all understood vegan to be that, Okay. I had never heard that a vegan didn't wear leather, didn't wear wool, 
didn't eat honey, didn't um, use, you know, Botox or anything like that. I, you know, I, I'd heard of the term cruelty free, of course, but I know loads of people who are carnivores or omnivores. Apparently, you have to call them now, and I'm not to call them carnivores, you have to call them omnivores. See all these fucking words that are now to be politically correct. We need to use the correct term all the time. So, um, I, of course, but I know plenty of carnivores or omnivores, whatever, meat eaters who are cruelty free and who will advocate for cruelty free and advocate for the Yule and Dog Festival to be, uh, you know, abolished in the world. But then here they are talking into a big stick, you know. So, human and human beings are a little screwy sometimes with their beliefs and their definitions. And so, whenever I then, so whenever I became vegan, I did not understand vegan to mean anything other than does not eat animals. And so I started the Sculpt of Vegan. I started my, um, my mostly my Instagram actually. So I'd started my Instagram and it was starting to grow and I was posting and I was you know, doing all kinds of stuff and I was building the Sculpt of Vegan as a business. We had the website that we had built and, you know, I was starting to, to grow it. And I remember one day posting something, I think it was on Instagram and I posted myself wearing a cashmere sweater. And someone wrote to me very respectfully, okay, not in any judgy, angry way. She wrote to me as a direct message and she said, can I just ask, are you vegan or are you plant-based? And I was like, what? And I, so I messaged back and I was like, I don't understand the question. What, what do you mean? And she said, I'm just wondering, are you vegan or, you know, are you plant-based? Is it that you just don't eat animal products or are you fully vegan and that you don't use any animal products? And I was stunned. I was like, what? Really? Oh my God, I had no idea. So I actually started to get my fight or flight bunch off. Like, oh my God, oh my God, like, am I, am I, am I doing something wrong? Am I like, you know, I'm not, am I not being a good vegan? Am I, so I got like a little bit scared and I wrote back and I was like, I, you know, honestly, I had no idea there was a difference. And I said, I guess then I'm plant-based because I do, you know, have, I do own and wear leather products and, you know, I have loads of cashmere and wool and, and I don't know that I'm prepared to give up cashmere actually, or wool, to be honest, you know, I really then began to question, is this, is this a, do I have to do this to be vegan. And so we had a conversation back and forth. And that was the first time I had ever heard about the um, the difference between veganism and plant-based. I didn't even know that, you know, that existed. And so I find myself with an ethical dilemma. Okay. So I find myself with an ethical dilemma because it was like, do I change my name or do I just keep going? And I really thought about it long and hard for many days, if not weeks, I was like, okay. And then I began to look up, would I change, you know, the sculpted plant-based or the plant-based? And I began to play around, it just doesn't sound right, the sculpted, no, it's, you know, the pl plant-based. And I was saying, oh, I'd have to change my whole business. I have to, and I had really thought long and hard over the name, the sculpted vegan. And everybody loves the name. It's such a good name, I believe. And, and I was like, and then I, and then I went back and I was like, no, 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 let's just take the fear out of it, Kim. Because the fear was, oh, what are the, what are the vegans going to think of me? And I know so many people who are, in inverted commas, vegan, who are so terrified of putting them out there. I know a lot of vegan influencers, okay? Big vegan fitness influencers who are wearing leather and who, who are driving around in cars with leather seats, but they never post those on social media because God forbid the world might see that they're not perfect. But listen, I'm not judging them because I understand because whenever you you're, you know, you're the vegans see you as vegan and then they see you driving around in a car with leather seats. Well, by God, you better prepare yourself for the onslaught of shit that you're going to get. You know, the hate that will come at you is unbelievable. Although I'm prepared for it. I'm like thick skin, so I don't give a shit. But, um, and so I really had this ethical dilemma. Do I change the name or do I keep the name the same? And so I sat down and I was like, okay, why am I vegan? Why did I decide to go vegan? Okay. Why did I decide to go vegan? Well, I decided to go vegan because my definition of the word vegan, plant-based, whatever you call it, because genuinely, I do not want to eat animals. I believe that eating animals is not only damaging to animals, causing suffering, untold suffering to animals, but it is damaging the ecosystem of the world because animal the, the farming of animals is contributing to more CO2 emissions than the aviation industry. So not only is it destroying animals and destroying life, but it's destroying our planet. And so for me, it's just not about, you know, the, the suffering of the animals. It's I look at it on a macro scale. I look at it on a much, much bigger scale. It, it's, it was different years ago when someone farmed a pig 
and then they 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 raised that pig and then they killed it and then they ate it for their family. I I just still don't think it's right, but I don't begrudge anyone who's willing to kill their own animal and eat it. I think that if you're willing to go to the effort to raise an animal and kill it and skin it and cut out all of its guts and then cook it and serve it, well, I think you're entitled to eat that animal, right? But if you're going into a supermarket and buying bacon out of a packet, but you're going, oh, I love pigs, I love pigs. Oh my God, the burby pigs, I couldn't possibly, oh, I can't see any suffering in the pigs. I'm like, but you're eating bacon. But whenever it comes in a sterile packet on the shelf and you don't have to see the suffering that, that put it there, you don't actually have to look that pig in the eye before you slit its throat or you put a bullet in its head, then, you know, I think that you really need to question your your ethics, I guess. You really need to question your, your motives. You have to question yourself as a human being because if you're not prepared to kill the animal yourself, if you're not prepared to look that animal in the eye and kill it, then you really need to question your humanity, I guess, right? So that is my belief. That is why I became vegan. Now, why do I wear leather products? Why do I, you know, um, have leather seats in my car and that kind of stuff? And I'm going to explain my belief to you. And I don't expect you to, to agree with it, but I'm going to explain to you why it is this way. Because I believe that leather is a byproduct of the animal industry. I don't believe that it's truth. Okay. It is true. So a lot of the the things that we that we use, like leather is a is a good one to um to think about, you know, and and is a byproduct of the animal industry. Now, wool, would I ever stop using wool? Well, no, I don't have a a sorry, hang, hang on. Let me go back to leather first. It's a byproduct of the animal industry. If we stopped killing animals for meat, then we would leather would cease to exist. Okay. Because people wouldn't kill the animal for the leather because it would become far too expensive. It's the same as things like gelatin and milk powder and all of those different stuff that they put in in, in uh, potato chips. Uh, milk powder is in everything. It's unbelievable. And gelatin is as well. Like there's so many vegetable based, you know, veggie gels and that kind of stuff you can use in replace of gelatin. But it's they whenever they kill the animal, they want to use the entire animal. Okay. Um, and so leather is a byproduct of the animal industry. If we stopped eating animals, a lot of the byproducts would cease to exist and it would bring the industry to a halt. So therefore, I believe that I am making or affecting the biggest change in the world by going to the source and by stopping eating animals. Now, will me wearing leather or buying leather, will that make any difference to the world? No. And my highest value, because I'm very clear on it, is affecting change on a global level, on a macro scale. That is my value. My value is not me not wearing leather and not eating meat and not causing suffering, whatever. My value is how many people can I reach that's where I put my effort into and that's what I put my time into. I don't obsess about buying leather or not buying leather or buying wool or about not buying wool, okay? Now, I do believe that that how we farm um, sheep for wool and how we farm goats for cashmere uh, isn't ethical. I believe human beings, are they, they're so destructive. It really isn't ethical. Now, if I... If wool was ethically sourced, and because it's actually the sheep love getting their getting their coat sheared because they become so heavy for them in the winter and they become really long and matted. And so, you know, I'm perfectly happy wearing wool because the animal is not harmed for the wool. Okay. The animal is not killed for the wool. So I don't have the belief that vegans have that, you know, if it comes from an animal, that it's we're not entitled to it. I don't have that belief at all. If someone wants to keep chickens and looks after them really well on their on their farm or on in their garden and they want to eat the eggs from the chicken, well, that's completely up to that person. We used to have chickens years ago and they used to come into the house. They used to jump on top of me when I was sunbathing in the garden and I used to like stroke them and they used to lift all their feathers. And, and, and so I don't believe that if anyone is going to keep a chicken and keep it really well, that eating an egg from a chicken is a bad thing. That's my personal belief. And I have thought about this a lot. And what I find is many of the angry vegans haven't actually thought about it. They, they're just acting on a principle that they have adopted, which is to do with veganism. And they're so terrified of being punished the way they punish other people that they remain scared and they never question their beliefs. Because whenever you are a person who punishes someone else, you're very fearful that someone else is going to judge and punish you in the same way. So you try to keep everything closed and everything, you know, you know batten down the hatches. Don't let anyone in. Don't let anyone see the real me in case they judge or punish me. 
But unfortunately, that just comes from a place of fear. So that is why I chose not to eat meat. That is why that is why I choose not to eat meat. And that whenever I decided to keep the word vegan, what I realized was most of the world understands vegan to mean does not eat animal products. So if I change, and my goal, understand, my goal was to reach as many people as possible with my message. That was my goal. Very mindful goal. I wanted to reach as many people as possible. I chose the bodybuilding platform to do it. I knew that if I stood up strong and sculpted and powerful with the word vegan beside my name, people would see the visual of me strong and sculpted and powerful. And the word vegan, they would put two and two together and I wouldn't need very many other words. And it would dispel so many myths about protein, so many myths about, um, you know, about, about you can't build muscle on a vegan diet. And people would go, oh, wow, she looks pretty fucking hot for a 40-year-old and she's vegan? Hmm, must look into this veganism thing. So let's just go back to what Dominic said, right? So Dominique, Dominique or whatever her name is, she said... You are only vegan where and when it's convenient. That's a projection, by the way. When someone says you are something, what they're really telling you is, I am this way. So I'm projecting it onto you. So here's here's what Dominic thinks on the inside. You are vegan only where and when it's convenient or when it's making you a shitload of money. Now, what I've just described to you, does that sound like my highest value was convenience or making money? No. That was not my my highest value. It never, ever was. My highest value was reaching as many people as possible with my mission. And I knew that if I kept the word vegan, I would reach more people because they have more of an understanding of that word than plant-based. If I had have called myself, what is it she said I should call myself? Sculpted plant-based chick. Do you think if I had have stood up as the sculpted plant-based chick, people would understand what the fuck I was about? <laughs> Maybe you guys listening to this podcast because you're all, you know, you've, I, do you know what? Interestingly, 80% of people who listen to this podcast and buy my programs are not vegan or even vegetarian. I sell programs to 5% vegans. The other 15% are vegetarian and 80% are carnivores. So let's go back to what I was saying, okay? Dominic says that all I want to do is make money. And all I want to do is, what was the other thing she said? Oh, yes, when it's convenient. I'm only, I'm only vegan when it's convenient and to make money. But actually, I sat down before I decided to move forward with the name vegan after I discovered there was a different difference. And I purposely chose to keep it because I knew that I could reach more people with that name. Last year. Let me think. Was it last year or the year before? I think the business has been open now two, nearly three years. It'll be three years this October. Okay. And this is now September. So three years next month. So three years next month, we will have sold over 20,000 programs. 20,000 programs, more than, I can't give an exact number, but I know that it's more than that. So out of 20,000 programs sold, I'm just going to pull out my calculator here and do the math. Only 1,000 of those were vegan. Out of 20,000 programs sold, approximately 16,000 of those were meat eaters. Who do you think... <laughs> is reaching more people and making a bigger difference in the world. Me or Dominique. Now, this podcast was really not about I'm better than her or she's making more, more of a difference than me. <laughs> really wasn't, okay? What this program, what, what this podcast was about, and I've still got a bit more to go, was about how many times in your life, I want you to, I want you to think about this, right? Maybe you're, maybe you're listening to this and you're like, you know what, Kim, I am one of those really passionate ethical vegans and it, and I too get angry with people and I get really upset and I can I can try Dominique on because I felt angry with you before okay and I, I understand I do have a lot of people who who don't agree with me who buy my programs and are in my program uh, and in my company and I get that 100% right and so but what I want to encourage you or what I want to have you ask yourself is have you really examined 
how you can make a difference in the world, how you can make a bigger difference in the world. Because if you're going to be vegan for vegan's sake, you're not really making any change in the world. But let me tell you, see to stand up and see to actually decide that you want to make a difference in the world. It requires vulnerability and it requires getting in the ring. It requires putting yourself out there, exposing yourself to danger, taking risks and making yourself vulnerable. Who do you think is making themselves more vulnerable? Me or Dominique? It takes zero courage to be a troll on Instagram. Zero courage to expose yourself, the good and the bad, the, the, you know, the upsides and the downsides, the reasons behind why you became vegan or vegetarian or plant-based or whatever and risk being attacked. It takes zero courage to be a troll. So why though, why, why, why does someone use this method of attack in order to promote veganism? Well, firstly, I believe it's because, like I said earlier, they haven't thought about their reasons for being vegan. They haven't truly examined how they want to affect the world. They don't have a game plan for how to spread their message to more people. They have decided to spread the message of veganism by making people feel bad about themselves through shame and punishment. But I understand why this happens. And I don't judge them for it because they really don't know any other way. I I fortunately knew another way because I've learned another way. And I'm a very systems-focused person. I'm a very um, open-minded, macro worldview person. So rather than just looking at me and being very... Um, almost narcissistic, like, you know, what's important to me and how can I do this and how can I protect myself? I am willing to put myself on the line to, to affect change in the world. But I understand why people use this method. And I'll tell you how I understand it. Because I remember whenever I was in primary school, I was very young. So I was only maybe, uh, I don't know what you guys call primary school in America, like elementary school or something. I was, I was four. So whatever you are, whenever you're four. And I hadn't been in school that long. And I remember whenever I started school, because I'm the youngest of three girls and my sisters, there's three in three years. So I used to watch my sisters go out to school every day. And I wanted to go to school too, because, you know, they used to leave every morning and I was left at home for the few hours, you know, that they were at school. And I remember, you know, even at a very young age, I remember wanting to go to school. And then I remember like my first day at school. And I remember my sister showing me around and showing me where the toilet was. And it was a very small school because we grew up in the country. And my, my uncle was the headmaster. And we used to call him Uncle Arnold. And he's like, no, 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 you can't call me Uncle. Arnold here. You have to call me headmaster. So um, he, uh, so anyway, my sisters were showing me around and they showed me the classrooms whenever we were in different classrooms, obviously, but I was in, I was in what we call P1, primary one, and I was only four. And I remember this particular day, like the, the teacher was actually, was, was quite nice. Like we all liked her. She was really, she wasn't like a real bitch. The, the, the teacher who taught it was such a small primary school that uh, primary one and two, so those two classes were in the same classroom together. And then P primary three, four, and five were together. The same teacher taught three classes and they were in another classroom. And then six and seven were in, um, were in a different classroom. The older ones were in a different classroom. And so, um, the, the teacher who taught, her name was Miss King, I think it was, who taught primaries three, four, and five. She was a real bitch, right? You, you didn't want to get on the wrong side of her. She was a real hard nut. But the, the one who taught, thankfully, the younger ones, the four, five, and six-year-olds was really, really nice. I can't even remember her name. Um, so anyway, she, I remember this particular day we were in class and I must have been chatting to my friend beside me. And I, I don't even remember like that maybe we must have been told to be quiet or to not be talking or to concentrate on our work or something. But I have absolutely no recollection of anything that happened before I was obviously whispering or giggling or something with my friend. And the next thing, the teacher rounded on me and she was like, Kim. And I was like, oh. and she said, that's it. Go to the naughty corner. And I was like, what? And she said, go to the naughty corner. You've been talking to whatever her name was, Wendy, let's say her name was, you've been talking to Wendy. And I told everyone to be quiet, go and stand in the corner. And I remember looking over to the corner because you know, like it was a naughty corner where, where the, the children who were bad were made to go and stand. And I had never, ever had to go to the naughty corner. I was not a bad child. I was, it would have been horrifying for me. Because you know the way you always had little shits in your class, the ones who were always pushing the boundaries and, you know, and who are always being told off and sent to detention in the naughty corner. I was not one of those children. I was a really, really nice child. I was such a, a you know, a people pleaser. 
And I was like, looked at her and I was absolutely horrified. And I remember getting up and I was, I was so embarrassed, right? I was so embarrassed. And the whole class went quiet and I felt like all of the other kids looking at me and they were probably like, they probably felt bad for me. But of course I felt, I just felt so embarrassed. And I got up and I walked over to the corner and I stood in the corner like, st and I remember standing in the corner, staring at the wall. And I honestly just felt like I was going to cry. And I was only four. And I remember thinking, I just want my mommy. I just want my mommy. And I was standing there and I honestly felt like, like all of the eyes of the classroom were boring into my back. But of course, nobody was looking at me because they were all so bloody terrified that they were going to be sent to the naughty corner. But I felt like they were all staring at my back. And I was just like, oh my God, this is awful. This is terrible. They were all like, and I felt so so ashamed. I felt so ashamed that I had been singled out, pulled out in front of the class, made to stand in the naughty corner. And I felt so deeply upset and so deeply ashamed. So I don't know how long that I was there for, but after must probably a couple of minutes, five minutes, maybe or whatever, the teacher said to me, okay, Kim, you can come back to your seat now. So I went, I went back to my seat and of course I was very subdued for the whole rest of the day. I, there was no more chat or giggles out of me. And, you know, I, I remember being desperately upset about it. It was in the afternoon and I remember my mum came to collect me and I went running out to the gates to meet my mum and I burst into tears the minute I saw her and she was like, what's the matter? And I was like, I was made to stand in the naughty corner. And I was, and my mom said to me, well, you must have done something bad. I was like, I didn't do anything bad. That, that was in the days when your parents told you that if you were told off in school, you must have done something bad. They didn't like go on the rampage and tell the teacher that they were wrong for like shouting at your child. It was always like the belief was the child was bad. But, and the reason why I'm telling you about this experience is because it always stayed with me. The feeling of standing in the corner and staring at the wall and thinking that the rest of the eyes of the classroom were boring into my back, right? Just made me feel so, so, so deeply ashamed. But let me ask you a question. Do you think as a young child, I understood why what I did was bad? In fact, let me go even deeper. Was what I did actually bad? Did it destroy value? Was it backward moving for mankind? If the, true, if the teacher had truly wanted me to learn why it was important to pay attention, do you not think that she might have handled it differently? If her intent was for me to understand the importance of paying attention to what she was teeping, teaching because it would benefit me in the long run to be able to read or learn the mathematic or mathematics or, or it would benefit me as an adult. If I, me, little Kim, little four-year-old Kimmy, if I was truly, if teaching me for my benefit was truly her highest value, do you think that she would have punished me in the way she did? No. What would she have done? Well, she may have pulled me aside. Uh, she may have said, Kimmy, can you, can you come here for a wee minute? And ask me gently to come up to the front of the classroom. She may have then said, I've noticed that, you know, you're having fun with Wendy and that's wonderful, but I really need you to pay attention right now. Do you think you could pay attention for me? Because this is really important that you learn this. Do you think I might've gone, oh yes, of course, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize. Do you think that I may then have paid attention and, and respected her and understood her and listened to what that it was she wanted from me? Of course I would. But in that moment, me learning for the sake, for, for me, right? I, as a human being, little Kimmy was not the teacher's highest value. The teacher's highest value was shutting me up so she could get control of the classroom and perform her job. That was her highest value in the moment. So she sacrificed me for what she wanted. And that's exactly what happens when you punish someone for not being vegan enough. You sacrifice the person. You sacrifice the mission for the mission. If your intent as a vegan is to be a more compassionate person, is if it's to build more compassionate human beings who truly understand the meaning of hurting another living being, you would never punish that person. You would never hurt them to stop their behavior. When you hurt someone to stop them behave, stop their behavior, it's because you want to control them. It comes from a place of fear, which means your belief about veganism comes from a place of fear. When something comes from a place of fear, it doesn't come from a place of ethics. Do you know why 
meat eaters purchase my programs because I don't come at them from a place of fear. I am perfectly happy with my decision to be vegan, plant-based, whatever you want to call it. I have no need to punish them for their beliefs or for their behaviors or for their choices because mine comes from a place of ethics. It doesn't come from a place of fear. And it comes from a place of ethics because I have thought long and hard about why I am vegan, about choosing the name vegan to promote what it is that's important to me. I don't promote what I think should be important to me. And I don't promote what the other vegans or the ethical vegans want to be important to me. I promote what's important to me because I have thought about the world on a macro scale and I have thought about what the world needs more of. And do you know what the world needs more of? The world needs more ethical, compassionate people. If the world had more ethical, compassionate people who thought on a macro scale, people may not choose to eat meat. They may not. They may, but they may not. But one thing I do know is that shaming someone and taking out your anger and fear on them never, ever, ever affects change, ever. If you blame and punish someone who doesn't live up to your expectations, it's not furthering your mission. You cannot be selective. When something is important to you, it's up to you to uphold it. It's not up to somebody else to uphold it. I don't expect any other vegans or any other people to uphold what's important to me in the world. I just go about my life sharing my life's work with people and opening myself up to them in the hope that they will be open-minded enough to see things from my point of view and to maybe try on a different perspective. But when something's important to you, it's up to you to uphold it, not up to somebody else. I remember whenever I was pregnant, um, just one final story before we finish. I remember when I was pregnant with, uh, with Jack. So it's funny, this has been quite an emotional episode for me, actually. It's been, it's, I really... I really feel very, very, very passionate. I guess this this goes to the core. What I'm speaking about here goes to the core of why I do what I do in the world. It goes to the core of who I am as a person. And that actually is quite emotive for me whenever I talk about it. But um, And this is quite a hard story for me to tell you, but I think it's important to tell it here because it illustrates a point that I want to make. And I remember whenever I found out that I was pregnant with Jack, I, I did not want to be pregnant with Jack. I did not want to be pregnant with anybody. I had three children under the age of four. And Maya was only 13 months. Kai was um, Kai was three. He had just turned three. And he hadn't even turned three, actually. And he would have been uh, three in... I found out I was pregnant with Jack in January, actually. February, sorry. Maya had turned one in January. Found out I was pregnant with Jack in February. Kai was still two. He didn't turn three until April. And Corey was four. He had turned four just before Christmas. So I had three children under the age of four. I was absolutely and utterly exhausted. Ryan worked away all the time. I had just started to build a new business. I, I had started a language company for the kids. Um, I had I had taken on staff. I was so busy and I found out that I was <laughs> found out that I was pregnant. And I remember the morning that I found out I was pregnant. I, I It was a Sunday night and I was going to bed and I realized that my period hadn't come and my period is never late, ever, 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 ever. And it was, it was Sunday night and as I was going to bed, I thought, oh, I'm sure my period should have come like yesterday. And I, I, this is, I didn't used to keep it on a calendar or anything then, but I just knew it was due. And Ryan came to bed at the same time as me. And I said, Ryan, my period hasn't come. I think I might be pregnant. And he said, there's no way you're pregnant. You're on the pill, but I was on the mini pill, right? Which isn't the combined pill because I was breastfeeding. So it just thickens the mucus at the neck of your womb. So if you miss it for a day, you, um, you, you could be pregnant. And so I had missed a day mid-month and I knew that I'd missed a day, but I was like, oh, you know, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. And, um, so anyway, I'd, I I told myself I'd be fine. And so I was like, oh my God, what if I'm pregnant? So I couldn't sleep all night. I was like, no, no, I'm sure I'll be fine. Couldn't sleep all night. Woke up the next morning at 6 a.m. It was a Monday morning and I knew the supermarket would be open because it opens at 6 a.m. on a Monday and the kids don't wake up till seven. And I said to Ryan, 
Ryan, I'm, I, I said, I'm going to the supermarket to get a pregnancy test. And he said, you're going now? And I said, yes, I'm going now. And I jumped out of bed and I hopped in the car and I drove to the supermarket and I'd already paid. You know the way you have to like the morning pay if you're really early? I'd already paid, but I didn't care. I went to the supermarket, bought a pregnancy test, came back home, went into the bathroom. The kids had just woken up as I came back, went into the bathroom, pulled it out, paid on the stick, just a little tiny dribble of pee that I could get out, looked at it as it soaked up the stick and it went one line for the test, two lines for pregnant. And I went, oh my God. And I burst into tears. I was like, I cannot have another baby. I fucking cannot have another baby. I cannot. And I went back into the bedroom and I actually don't think the kids were awake yet. I went back into the bedroom and I went, and I, and I went, fucking pregnant. And Ryan went, you're pregnant? That's brilliant. And I went, this is not fucking brilliant. This is not brilliant. Don't you fucking tell anyone I'm pregnant. Don't you dare. Don't you tell anyone. He went, but Kim, this is really good. And I went, it's not good. It's not good at all. And do you know what I wanted him to say to me? I just wanted him to go, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I know how hard this is for you. But Ryan did not want to recognize how hard it was for me because if he recognized how hard it was for me, he would have to recognize how fucking little he did with the kids. And then, and I, if he actually recognized how hard it was for me, then he might have to look at his own lack of participation. Um, we've worked through this, by the way. I'm not angry about it anymore. That We've done a a lot of work recently on this, but uh, I was very angry for many years. And uh, so anyway, I got into bed and I was like, this is, I was like, don't you tell anyone, don't you dare tell anyone. And he was like, Kim, seriously, this is not a problem. We can afford another baby. We already have three. It's really not an issue. So then the kids started to, they came into the bedroom and they were like, morning, morning. And they started coming in and jumping into the bed. And well, actually, well, told their wife. Actually, we weren't co-sleeping at that time. This is before we had the big bed. We only had Maya in with us. And so, and then I started to cry. I and they were like, "Why, mommy, crying? Why, mommy, crying?" And I was like, <laughs> I was like crying my eyes out. And of course, I was getting no sympathy from Ryan, and I totally felt like he didn't understand me. And um, and so I just was like, "This is the worst thing that has ever happened to me. I cannot be pregnant. I only just got my body back. I was like working really hard. I was doing loads of Pilates, and I did not want to be pregnant again." So anyway, then I I so I said to Ryan later on that morning, I was like, "I am having an abortion." And he was like, you are not having an abortion. I was like, I am. I'm having an abortion, Ryan. I am not having another child. And of course, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, do I, could I go through with an abortion? Could I actually go through with an abortion? And, and then I was like, you know, but I, I think that I didn't actually want to have an abortion. Do you know what I wanted more than anything? I wanted Ryan or someone to say, I understand. I understand how hard this is for you. And I'm here for you. That's what I wanted Ryan to say. I wanted Ryan to put his arms around me and say, I understand. And whatever you decide, I will be here for you. That's what I wanted Ryan to say. But Ryan never said that. Ryan said, oh, wind your fucking neck in. You're not getting a bloody abortion. And I was like, you can't fucking stop me. You can't stop me. I will get an abortion. I no, abor Abortions are illegal in Northern Ireland, but they are legal in England. I was like, I will go to England and I will have an abortion. And anyway, I phoned my mom that morning and I was like, and mom answered. She was like, hello. I was like, mom, I have something really terrible to tell you. And she thought I was going to say I have cancer. Okay. And I was like, I'm pregnant. She was like, oh my God, Kim, you scared the shit out of me. I thought you were going to tell me you had like a, a tumor or something. I was like, no, it's even worse than that. I'm pregnant. And I, you have no idea how devastated I was. I was devastated. I I was living in hell with four, with three children. Anyone here who listens to this with young children, with a lot of young children will understand. I was in hell with three children under the age of four. It was a permanent non-stop roundabout of emotions and snot and vomit and and sleepless nights and breastfeeding. And like I was still breastfeeding Maya at the time. And oh my God, I was just absent, absent in other hell. So I said, right, I'm having an abortion. And, and I started and I looked up clinics in England and I made inquiries and I was looking up flights and I said to Ryan, I'm, I'm booking these flights. I'm going for an abortion ASAP. I'm only, I'm very early. I'm only like four weeks or something because I've only just missed a period. And so I was like, I'm, I'm going for an abortion. It's very early. It's just a bunch of cells. And he was like, Kim, you cannot go through with this. You can't, you couldn't honestly abort a child of ours. You couldn't do it. And I was like, you fucking watch me. I could. And I guess I was being mean to him because I just wanted him to say, I understand you. That's all I wanted him to say. Kim, I understand you. But of course he couldn't say it. And so 
I was, I, so I said, I'm booking these flights, or whatever. So when he and my mom started having all these meetings, like intervention meetings, we have to stop her. She can't do this and whatever. And so, um, and so I went through this whole turmoil of, you know, will I, won't die? Will I, won't die? Will I, won't die? And the worst part of, about it was I had booked to go to, to uh, New York. I had won a trip to New York, right? I was supposed to be leaving. This was a Monday. I was leaving on Friday to go to New York for a trip um, with some girlfriends, which I had won to meet Helena Christensen, the supermodel, right? And I was like, oh, I had just seen this as like, oh my God, this is like an amazing trip away to New York, a boozy weekend with the girls. And all I could think of was, I'm fucking pregnant now. I can't drink and I can't whatever. You know, everything that I was looking forward to just seemed to be slipping away. And so anyway, I, I, I said to Ryan, I made him swear to see, swore, swore him to secrecy. I said, don't you tell a single bloody person that I am pregnant. Don't you tell anyone that I am pregnant because I do not know if I'm keeping this child. So I went through this whole week of, you know, of just being so cross and angry and upset and whatever. And then I went away to New York. Um, I went away to New York the, the following weekend and I kind of got used to the idea a wee bit more. And I decided whenever I was in New York that I would keep the child. I actually went to um, I went to visit a friend of mine who was in New York, and she's one of my best friends ever. And of course, I poured my heart out to her, and she helped me through a lot of stuff. And she just put her arms around me, and she said the words that I wanted to hear, which was, I understand how hard this is for you, and no matter what you decide, I will be here for you. I will talk to Ryan. I will support you. I will come with you. I will fly to England, and I will be with you if you have the abortion. And that's all I wanted to hear. I just wanted somebody to hear, to tell me that they were there with me, and they understood me. So after spending the weekend with her, I went home and I said to Ryan, I've decided to keep the baby. I said, but I said, I have a condition of, on keeping the baby. I said, I haven't decided hundred percent, but I think I'm going to keep it, but I have a condition. And he said, what is it? And I said, I want you to have a vasectomy after, you know, now or after the baby is born. And he said, no, I don't think I can. And I said, I want you to have a vasectomy because I said, if I have to carry this child, breastfeed, raise it as well as doing everything else with the other, you know, and co-sleep and all of the night feeds and everything that that comes with it. If I have to go through that again, then you will fucking have a vasectomy. So he was like, okay, I will. I agree. And I, and no, but I don't, don't think he said, I agree. Here's what he said. He said something like, okay, I, I will look into it. And and then I was like, no, 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 it's not about looking into it, Ryan. It's you are agreeing that you are going to have a vasectomy. And he said, okay, I agree. So I said, okay. And I at least felt that he was having to, he was having to carry some of the burden, right? So I went through with the pregnancy. I was very angry to be pregnant until I had about 20 weeks. And I don't know, I think I my my best friend from New York. She came over again and we had another conversation. She basically counseled me through that whole pregnancy. I was very pissed off and angry, but angry at my body. I was angry at my body for getting fatter. I was angry at Ryan. I was just angry. I was angry the whole way through that pregnancy. And I... Anyway, uh, towards the end of it, of course, I accepted it and I got excited. And, and of course, now we have beautiful Jack, who's eight years of age. And Jack is just the most adorable little boy. And of course, I wouldn't change it for a single thing. But here's what happened, okay? Here's why I'm telling you the story. So after Jack was born, I said to Ryan, um, when are you, you know, have you booked your vasectomy? And he said, uh, and he was putting it off and putting it off and putting it off the whole way through the pregnancy. Because he was like, he just want to see, you know, because we might want to have more children. I don't want to cut off my chance of having more children. Like, say something happened, right? Say something happened and something happened to the baby or whatever. We might want to have more children. So um, so then after Jack was born, I said, Ryan, it's time to talk about, about the vasectomy. And he said, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not having one. And I was like, you're what? And he said, I'm sorry, Kim, I'm not going to go through with it. He said, I'm not ha having a vasectomy. He said, if something happened to you and you died and I wanted to get remarried, he said, I wouldn't be able to have any more children. And I was like, Ryan, if I fucking died, you're going to be the single father of four fucking children. No woman is going to touch you with a barge pole. <laughs> you're not going to be a good catch. Let me tell you, no matter how good looking you are or how big your willy is. I shouldn't say that in public. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> um, no, Ryan's gonna kill me. TMI. Uh, so moving swiftly on. So anyway, I, I but here's the thing, right? I was so angry 
with him. I was so angry and I was so upset. And he gave me all these reasons like, oh, but I've looked into it and there's a risk of this and there's a risk of that. And I was like, there's no fucking risk. Men have vasectomies every single fucking day. You're just backing out of your blah, blah, blah. And I was like, so I really felt like he had betrayed me, right? And I was so angry and so upset. But let me tell you guys, we have worked through this now again, okay? We we have, we actually have couples counseling sessions, couples coaching sessions like once a month. And we, we each have coaching sessions every single week. We both have a coach and um, we have we have coaching sessions. She's actually my business coach, but she does like, you know, uh, personal coaching too. So she coaches both of us every week. We have worked through this. I have no anger, resentment, nothing left towards my absolutely adorable husband. But at the time I was so cross and I remember going to see my stepmom um, with the kids one day and I remember just bursting into tears in the kitchen and telling her like, he promised me and I feel so betrayed by him. And I was so upset. It wasn't even that, you know, that it, that it wasn't that I didn't want to have any more kids. Well, I didn't want to have any more kids. It was just that I felt like he'd betrayed me. You know, I felt like it was his responsibility. He, he should be the one to have the vasectomy so that we wouldn't have to have any more children, you know? And, um, and anyway, so I carried this and I carried this and I carried this and I was so angry and I blamed him and I wanted to hurt him. And then one day I was having a session with my coach. Um, and I've always had a coach, by the way, I've always, always, always worked with personal coaches and business and, and personally. And, I, and I was telling her the story and I was like, I was just so angry with him. And she said to me, so she, she said to me, but honey, she said, I'm going to tell you something, which I don't think that you're going to want to hear, but I think it's very important for you to hear. And I said, what? And she said, if something is important to you, it's up to you to uphold it. And I said, I don't understand. What do you mean? And she said, you're the one who has to carry the babies, who whose body is affected, who's, you know, who has to feed the babies and, and has the sleepless nights and ultimately has the responsibility. So she said, if you don't ever want to have that responsibility, then it's up to you to make it happen. She said, Ryan may offer for, you know, he may offer, should it, like it's a completely separate issue that he has gone back on his promise, but that's a separate issue. Reneging on your promise is a separate issue to responsibility. I was making it his responsibility. I was like, he should be this way. He should have the vasectomy. She was like, there's no shoulds. She said, when there's a should, there's a right and a wrong. You're making you right and him wrong. She said, there's no right or wrong here. There's just, you don't want to have any more children. Ryan isn't offering to, to fix that, to make that a solution for you, or to fix that solution for you, or to give you a solution to that. So it's up to you to make it happen. And that, and instantly I had a shift. I was like, oh my God. Like it was obviously a lot more than that. We had a long, long, long session, about probably several sessions. But I had this, this realization that when something is important to me, it's up to me to uphold it in the world. It's not up to somebody else to uphold it in the world. It's not up to Ryan. I, I, I was blaming Ryan for not upholding my value. My value was, I don't want to have any more kids. My value was my sleep. My value was my sanity. My value was not yelling at my kids and not drinking too much wine to, me, to get through the day and the night. And, and I was making Ryan responsible for all of these things when they were my responsibility. And whenever I realized that, I stopped blaming him. I stopped making him wrong. I took responsibility and I was sterilized. I got sterilized um, sh very shortly afterwards and I was, I've was i been sterilized now for eight years and it's been the best thing that ever happened to me because, and it was so simple. It took one minute and 40 seconds. I got a, pro a procedure called S-Sure done, E-S-S-U-R-E, -S -E, S-Sure. It took one minute and 40 seconds, two little stents they put in your fallopian tubes, which then um, scar, tissue forms around, scar, scar tissue forms around them and then you are completely sterile. So I was sterilized and, and, it, was, and it was perfect. But what shifted for me was... I realized that you can't blame others for not upholding what you want in the world or what's important to you. No matter how much it hurts, you must take responsibility because here's the clinker, right? Whenever you blame someone, you're making yourself a victim of that person. You give them all your power. So whenever Dominique was blaming me for not being vegan enough for her, what she was saying was, she was giving me all of her power, all of her responsibility. She's looking outside of herself for some representation or some person or some ideal that she can cling on to as, a, as an idealistic viewpoint or an idealistic person and then make that person. She's like, I want Kim, I want you to go out and represent the vegans and do the hard yard and be vulnerable and put yourself in the fighting ring because I'm not willing to. 
and the fact that you're out there doing that thing that I want to see in the world, and now I realize that you're not vegan, well, I just want to blame you for it. But here's the thing, Dominique. I imagine you're not listening to this podcast because you've podcast because you've left all my groups and flounced off my social media. But I really, really wish that you would listen to this podcast because here's the thing, Dominique, or anyone out there who's like Dominique. If you want something in the world, it's your responsibility to uphold it. It's nobody else's. People can only be what they can be. They can only be who they are. But here's the thing that the angry vegans don't re don't recognize. We are fighting the same war. We're fighting the same war. We're working towards the same cause. But they are doing it with nastiness, with threats, with anger, and with fear. I'm doing it by making friends and inviting people into my party where the water is warm and the cocktails are cold. Do you think that the carnivores or the meat eaters of the world love me more because I buy Louis Vuitton? or love me less. Let me tell you something. They love me more. And the more meat eaters that come and buy my programs and follow me on Instagram and listen to this podcast and buy into my lifestyle and see that you don't have to eat animals, the more they're exposed to this as normal, the more it opens their minds. Do you know how many people I have single-handedly converted to plant to be eating plant-based or converted away from eating meat in the last three years? Thousands and thousands and thousands. How many has Dominique converted? I don't know. I wouldn't guess more than one or two by her attitude. So you really have to look at what is it that you want to see in the world. And sometimes the means does justify the end. People say the end doesn't justify the means. Well, I would disagree. Sometimes the means does justify the end as long as you're not sacrificing the mission for the mission. I don't eat animals. I will not eat animals ever again. And therefore, I am going to the source of what I believe is important. If you go to the source and you focus on the source, the ripples spread outward. It's like dropping a a stone or a pebble into a pond and the ripples go outward. If you try to focus on every single ripple, you get confused. If you just go to the source, you reach more people and you affect more change. Responsibility as a noun is defined as the state or fact of being accountable or to blame for something. If you take responsibility, you take accountability. You make yourself accountable for your own actions and for your responsibility in the world. That's what I do. When you do that, there's no fear. It's also defined as responsibility, the opportunity or ability to act independently and take decisions without authorization. I don't need the vegan community or the vegan police to authorize anything that I do. I understand where I'm going. I understand what I'm doing and I understand how I'm doing it. I don't always understand the process. I don't always understand how I'm going to get there and I don't always have a roadmap, but I understand what my values are and I understand what it is ultimately I am trying to achieve and ultimately what I'm trying to uphold. You must be accountable for upholding the values you want to express in the world. Every time you spend money or you exchange value with someone or you support someone, you're expressing your values. It's up to you to make sure that the person you are exchanging with upholds your value. If Dominic had have asked a few more questions before buying one of my programs, if she had have sent me a message on Instagram to check, was I an ethical vegan or was I plant-based? I would have been honest with her. I would never have lied. And then she would have found out that I didn't support her values in the world and she could have chosen to go and purchase from someone else. She didn't ask those questions. She saw the word vegan, the sculpted vegan. She made an assumption and then she blamed me for not living up to her expectations. But whenever she gave Whenever she made it my responsibility to uphold her value, she gave away all of her power to affect change in the world. If you're passionate about creating change, you must first look to where you are responsible. Look at every situation where you want to blame someone and ask yourself, how did I cause myself to be 
in this situation? How am I responsible? If Dominic had have asked herself, oh, wow, how did I cause myself to be in this situation where I have purchased a program from someone who is not an ethical vegan? Because being an ethical vegan is the highest expression of my value in the world. She could have examined those choices and then she could have chosen differently next time. But she didn't. She blamed me. So therefore, she's now a victim of me and she'll probably make the same mistake again. When you don't take responsibility for your choices, you keep making the same mistake again and again and again and again, and you never, ever, ever learn. But if you ask yourself those questions, you'll find out that you are more of a potent force in the world. Victims believe that they are an effect of the world. Go-getters believe that they are that they affect the world. I don't believe I am at the effect of the world. I believe that I affect the world. I am not a victim. No one else is responsible for my life but me. And when you take responsibilities for your actions, you feel like you can change the things you don't like in the world and you can live a life free from fear. Don't be a victim, guys. Final point. Final point. This has been a very, very, very passionate episode for me. But I leave you with this final word. Don't be a victim. Raise your base state. Be grounded. Be open. Be inclusive and be less fearful. Open up your world. Open up your mind and invite the meat eaters in, the people who you want to try to convert to plant-based way of living or to veganism. Try them on. Understand their struggles. Try and understand where they're coming from. But in order to do that, you first have to understand yourself. You have to be willing to look inside and address and recognize your fears. If you put them in the box and you you pretend that they're not there, then you can never, ever, ever understand the fear in anyone else. If you're not honest with yourself, you can never be honest with other people. And if you can't be honest with other people, you can never be vulnerable. And if you can't be vulnerable, you can never understand vulnerability in others. And how people connect with one another is by being vulnerable. I'm very vulnerable with you guys on these podcasts. And because I'm vulnerable, we connect. I feel like I connect with you sitting here in my office talking into my microphone. I know I'm not talking to my microphone. I know I'm talking to you listening to this. I imagine you all in my mind's eye. We connect and I imagine you listening to this and these words touching you and you maybe being different in your lives. And that actually makes me emotional to even talk about it. But you, you, you have to be willing to open up and put yourself out there with, I was going to say without fear, you'll probably be fearful anyway, but if you're fearful, do it anyway, do it scared. You know, if you're fearful, just do it scared, but don't hold back in doing it because honestly being open, authentic and, and vulnerable is truly the only way to connect with people. And it's truly the only way to affect change in the world. In a world of fake In a world of perfect Instagram pictures and whitened teeth and perfect smiles and smooth wrinkles, be you. Because let me tell you, when you're you and you're vulnerable and you're open and you're raw and you're honest, you stand out in the world. And if you actually want to change the world and help the animals and stop the suffering, you gotta figure out a different way. You can't be fearful, judgmental, and angry anymore. And if you still continue to act that way, you don't really want to change. You don't really want to help the animals. Or maybe you do, but you want to you want to protect yourself more. And that's hard for a lot of people to hear. If you will not overcome your fear and figure out a different way, then it just means you want to protect yourself more than you want to help the animals. And that's okay. I don't judge you for it. There's many times when I've wanted to protect myself more than I've wanted to do the hard thing in the world, it's hard to put yourself out there and be judged, especially when you're a judgmental person because you think that everyone else is going to judge you as harshly as you judge everybody else. And you know what? Sometimes they will. Believe me, the hit that I get thrown at me on social media, the shit fests that go on about me and other bodybuilding groups because I dare to be myself. I dare to stand up and have an opinion and it's it's incredible how much that angers and irritates people. But if if you know if you're not angering and irritating people, you're not really doing anything worthwhile. Because let me tell you something: the brighter the light, the bigger the flies. Shine your light brightly, but shine it in such a way that it attracts people to you 
not in a way that blinds them. You always want to attract people to you and invite them into your world with empathy and with understanding. Blame, judgment, and punishment never, ever got anybody anywhere, and it certainly never changed the world. If you really try this in your life and you take this on, you will transform yourself, you will transform your life, and possibly you could also transform the world. So there you are. What do you think? That was a deep one, wasn't it? <laughs> oh my goodness, that was quite emotional and it was really long. I apologize for, for going on, but it really flowed that one for me. It's something that's so, so, so deep and so close to my heart and so passionate for me. Um, and I really love that you gave me the opportunity to, that you give me every single week the opportunity to have this platform and to share with you, you know, the deepest, darkest parts of myself. Because honestly, without you guys listening in, I would just be talking into a microphone with nobody listening. But um, anyway, I hope that you enjoyed it. Please do, whether you want to win a Sculpted Vegan program or not, leave me a review and let me know what you thought. I love leave it, this. I love watching, or not watching, reading the reviews. I read them every single week. So please do leave me a review wherever you listen to this. I read every single one of them. And thank you so much for listening. Um, send me a screenshot of the review on Instagram if you do want to win a program. Um, or if you just want me to read it on Instagram, you want to connect with me. If you want to connect with me and talk to me, just message me on Instagram, The Sculpted Vegan. I respond to every single direct message that I get, every single direct message. So definitely um, get in touch, reach out to me, tell me how this affected you, if it affected you. And um, thank you so much for listening. This is your host, Kim Constable, and I will catch up with you next week for another episode of the Strong and Sculpted podcast. Have a wonderful week. I love you loads from my heart to your heart. Bye for now.